When someone was crucified, their death was not from blood loss. No, the, uh, the Romans uh, had perfected the art of crucifixion, and they knew not to pierce any major veins or arteries when somebody was crucified. So their goal was actually to keep you alive uh, for as long as possible, to torture you as long as possible, to humiliate you for as long as possible, so that passersby might look up at you and, and see you there and say, I will never, ever, ever, ever do whatever that person did that landed them up on that cross. No, they didn't want you to die too quick. And sometimes you would last for hours. Sometimes you would even last for days. No, when you died from crucifixion, uh, you died from asphyxiation. You just couldn't breathe anymore. Uh, You know, the angle that you were positioned on the cross made it difficult for your diaphragm to catch a good breath. And so what you would end up doing is you would end up taking lots of shorter breaths. And and that actually then could lead to hyperventilation. And then from that, you know, the rest of the problems began to settle in. You'd have fluid kind of gather around your lungs, fluid gather around your heart. And that only made it even harder to breathe. And the only way to get a really good breath would be to actually press your weight down on the hands that had nails in it and on the ankles that that were nailed to the bottom of the cross and push yourself up high enough to expand your lungs, to expand your diaphragm, take a good breath, and then slump and settle back down into the position you were uh, before. Very, very difficult to take a deep breath. Uh, Now, from time to time, the victims would try to say something. It's very difficult to say something from a cross, at least something loud enough for people to hear. And in order to speak, of course, you would have to push yourself up, take a good deep breath, speak your word, and then again settle back down. Which is why those who were crucified actually spoke very little. It was just so, so painful and torturous. And yet seven times over the six hours that Jesus spent on the cross, he spoke a word. He spoke a phrase. And if he was going to force himself to speak, then you can bet he wanted us to hear it. Today we're starting a brand new teaching series going to take us all through Lent called Famous Last Words. And over the next six weeks, we're going to be exploring those seven final phrases that Jesus spoke in his final moments. We're going to take each one of those phrases and we're going to listen to it very, very carefully because these words were carefully preserved for us by the early church and all through history and brought down through the scriptures for us so that we could hear them today and we could meditate on them today. They thought it was very important. We heard these words and that's what we're going to do. What did Jesus want us to hear in his dying words on the cross? What did he mean? What is what do his words tell us about who he was? And what do his words tell us about who we are ourselves? And so today we begin in Luke 23, uh, verse 34, hearing Jesus say, or rather Jesus pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, before we go any further, it's important to point out a couple things about this verse. If you were to look it up in your Bible, Luke 23, verse 34, you would notice just a little footnote by that verse. And what it says is, this phrase does not occur in some of the earliest versions of Luke's gospel. Uh, There's a couple of reasons for that, why it didn't appear in the earliest copies of Luke gospel. And, you know, here's a couple of thoughts. One thought out there is that actually the early Bible copyists who made the copies of the Bible just could not stomach the idea that Jesus would want to forgive his executioners. And so they just cut it out of their Bible copies as they made it. Uh, But there's also another explanation too. It could be that this verse we have only because of a boy named Rufus, who was standing near the cross on the day that Jesus was crucified. Rufus, the son of Simon of Cyrene. There's a scholar and author named Adam Hamilton, who suggests that Luke, who was a historian, of course, would have recorded all these details of Jesus's life by interviewing people and all that stuff. But in the first wave of interviews that he did, 
nobody knew about this thing that Jesus said from the cross. They knew lots of other things Jesus said, lots of other things Jesus did, which made it into Luke's gospel. Uh, but when Luke's gospel later begins to be copied and spread around the, the Mediterranean area, finally, it ends up in the city of Rome, maybe 20, 30, 40 years later. And in the city of Rome, there happened to be a young man who, when he was a child, was actually standing by that cross, and that young man's name was Rufus. In fact, Paul, in his letter to the church in Rome, actually sends greetings to a guy named Rufus and his mother. And it is believed, this is the very same Rufus that is mentioned, as we just saw in Mark's gospel, that Luke didn't uh, mention by name in his gospel, but, but in the city of Rome, Rufus relocated to that area, and one day Luke's gospel shows up in Rome, in Rome, and they're reading it, and Rufus says, oh my goodness, it's amazing. Yes, it happened. It all happened. I, but there's something else. There's something that they're missing. And so Rufus would have added in that line that said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then, presumably, that gets copied out from the Roman versions of Luke's gospel and eventually becomes the standard text of our gospel today. So, that could very well be how these words came to us today. But in some ways, that's secondary. And the real thing we want to ask is, what are we supposed to learn from these words that have come to us today? So, I want to share with you four thoughts this morning. The first thought is this. I think one thing we're supposed to understand is we are the them. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them, who is he talking about? Certainly, you could say he's talking about those Roman soldiers that are down there gambling for his clothes, laughing, having just beat him to near death. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. He could be looking over here at the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the chief priests who are smiling smugly because Jesus is finally getting what he deserves. Father, forgive them. Maybe he's thinking of Pontius Pilate, Pilate who just hours ago had sentenced Jesus to death. Let them lead him away to death, even though there was nothing, no case could be made against him. Pontius Pilate was supposed to be the one who made sure justice happened, and here he had let this great injustice happen. Father, forgive them, forgive him. Or maybe he's looking at his disciples, the one who betrayed him, or the others who abandoned him in his time of need, Father, forgive them. But is there anyone else he's praying for when he's there on the cross saying, Father, forgive them? Well, the church throughout history has always believed that he's praying for us, for every person who has ever, ever been born, Father, forgive them. There's this old gospel hymn that we sometimes sing even here at Trinity on Good Friday. It's called, Were You There? And the lyrics to the song go, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Or were you there when they nailed him to the cross? Or were you there when they laid him in the tomb? What's the answer to that question? Well, on the one hand, no, we, we weren't there, of course. But on the other hand, the implication is, yes, we were there. We were there. We are the them. N.T. Wright wrote that when Jesus prays for the forgiveness of his executioners, he's praying not just for them, but for all, all who have ever fallen into the grips of the spiral of violence and hatred, which are always spirals of sin. Dietrich Bonhoeffer years earlier said, we are all responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. So when Jesus hangs on the cross and he looks down into that crowd and he says, Father, forgive them, he's looking into that crowd, but he's also looking past that crowd. He's looking past that space. He's looking down through time. His eyes are scanning through all of time until they finally lock eyes with mine. And he says, Father, forgive Rob, for he does not know what he's doing. Father, forgive JP. He doesn't know what he's doing. Father, forgive Annette. She does not know what she's doing. Father, forgive Mandy. She doesn't know what she is doing. Who are the them? We are the them. And if that's true, then this second point presents itself to us this morning. If we are the them, then it seems clear that we have a problem. 
Because if someone says, I forgive you, then that means that person has wronged you in some way. You don't forgive someone who hasn't done something to hurt you. So when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, that means that all those people, and us people too, we are the them, we have violated God in some way, strayed from the path, sinned. Sin is this condition that causes us to stray from God's path. Sin, in some ways, could just be translated as straying. There is this way that we're called to go and that we ought to go. And if we were to go in this way, the world would be at peace. Nobody would ever be hungry. Nobody would ever be sleeping on the streets. There would be no hatred. There would be no wars. There would be no affairs. There would be no divorce. There would be none of that. That's the way we are called to go. But we don't walk in that way. We walk in another way. Uh, and, and so in this path, we do all sorts of harm to ourselves, to others, and even to God. And so when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, it's a reminder, we've got a problem, right? There is something wrong with us in here, and we need to be fixed somehow. I can remember when I was an um, eight-year-old boy, and my mom took me into a corner store, and I asked her, Mom, can I get some double bubble, some like bubble gum or whatever? And I remember she said no, but that didn't matter. I just stole some anyways, which wasn't actually like me, but I did. I stole it, and I stuffed it in my pocket, and as we were walking back to the car, I was not a very smart thief, but I decided to try to unwrap it. I was holding hands with this hand, and I decided to try to unwrap it with my other hand, and she was like, what are you doing? She saw all the mess, the wrappers and everything. She grabbed me by that hand, dragged me back to the store, and uh, made me put that stuff back on the counter. I was thoroughly embarrassed. I've never been so embarrassed in my life, I don't think, because even at the age of eight years old, I was a thief. What was wrong with me? I had a problem. I still have a problem. You have a problem. We all have a problem. We stray from the path. And the good thing about Lent is it's kind of a 40-day period, which we're invited to look inside ourselves and look at that problem and look at the ways we stray and look at the brokenness inside us and say, where am I sick? You know, where is my heart blocked? What is my problem? Now, I just want to say, I know some people are visiting Trinity. Most Sundays, people are some, someone visiting Trinity. And, and you may say, oh, I hate going to church. Because whenever they go to church, they, you know, whenever I go to church, they talk about sin. And I don't want to talk about sin. And I don't want another guilt trip. And I totally understand that, that some people go to churches and they come back feeling worse than when you left to go to church. I just want to say, I don't think that actually describes Trinity. And I think it's actually really too bad that that happens at all. Because what Jesus is saying from the cross, what he is praying from the cross, is, is not about making us feel bad or guilty. That's not the focus of what he's saying, right? If you hear Jesus plea, he's not so much saying, you're a sinner, as he's saying, I'm a savior. He's not so much saying, you're guilty. He's saying, I have grace for you. Now, you can't obviously appreciate that grace until you know you've got a problem. I used this example earlier on at our early service, but imagine, for example, one day you start to develop chest pains and uh, you think, oh, it could just be anxiety or heartburn or something like that. But then what happens is you, you start to get shortness of breath and you start to feel a pain shooting down your arm. And at that point, you're like, ooh, I think I better go to the doctor. So you go to the cardiologist. They do some tests on you. They say, sir, I have got some very bad news, some good news, but some very bad news for you, and that's that you have some serious heart blockage. And we have to do emergency surgery right now, or you are going to die. So what do you say? Man, that doctor is such a downer. You know, I don't want to hear that. I'm going to, I'm going to go find a doctor that makes me feel good. Someone that's, a doctor that tells me some good things about my heart, right? I want good news, not bad news. You would never say that. You would never say that. You would say, thank you, doctor. Thank you. What can be done? Oh, you mean there's a cure? You mean there's, there's a way to be healed from this? Please, let's do the surgery. And you'd actually be slightly relieved, I think. And that is the thing about what Jesus is saying. He's saying, yes, we have this thing in us, sin that causes us to stray, but there is a cure for our heart condition. And therefore, Jesus' prayer from the cross should not make us feel guilty, should actually make us feel glad, make us feel joyful. There's a cure for our condition. 
And that brings us to the third point I want to raise with you this morning. Not only are we the them, and not only do we have a problem, but we have been forgiven. And intentionally, I want to use that in the past tense. We have been. Not you can be, but we have been forgiven. Because let me ask you this question. Do you think that God answered Jesus' prayer that day? Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Did God answer that prayer? If your son was dying, wouldn't you do anything? Wouldn't you give anything? Wouldn't you move heaven and earth to respond to whatever plea or whatever they asked you to do? Jesus there hanging on the cross. Father, I have a plea. I have a request. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Even as they're torturing me, even as they're making me suffer, even as they're laughing and mocking and sinning, Father, forgive them. I have to believe God answered that prayer. At that moment, he forgave them. And why? Because his son asked. Which means we are already forgiven. Remember, we are the them. Before you were born, before you did any of the cruddy, nasty, or, you know, despicable things we've all done in our lives, right? Before you asked for forgiveness or acknowledged your wrongdoing, God already answered his son's prayer and forgave you in advance. He did everything to redeem you. It's it's kind of confusing to figure out why Jesus dying on the cross forgives us of our, of our sins. And there's lots of different theories out there. They call them theories of the atonement. Uh, but I thought maybe I could just share one story with you today from the Old Testament that I think might help us understand a bit of what's going on there. You see, in the Old Testament, that's the older part of the Bible. Uh, in fact, from one of the oldest books of the Bible, the book of Leviticus, the third book in the 66-book Bible, Um, we read that there was this strange ritual that the Israelites used to go through. And what would happen is that, you know, the priest would, from time to time, I think annually, they would take a goat out to the edge of town, and the priest would lay his hands on the goat. This is where the phrase scapegoat comes from, by the way. And, um, And then he would confess over the head of that goat all the sins and all the wickedness and all the rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins on this live goat. And then he would send the goat out into the wilderness and off the goat would go and you would never see the goat again. And presumably it got eaten by some wild animal or maybe it just, hey, started to live in the wilderness somewhere. But the point is you never saw it again. It was gone. Now, my question is, Did this goat really take everyone's sins into the desert? I don't think so. But there is a visual image there that people's sins had just been carried away and they saw it. They saw the goat leave. They saw it disappear. I don't necessarily think it was that all the sins were heaped on the head of this goat, but it was that God was going to forgive their sins. Yes, God was going to forgive their sins, but he wanted them to understand that it's going to cost a living creature its life. So when Jesus is dying on the cross, we see all the sins of the world, all the hatred, all the bigotry, all the prejudice, all the poverty, all the injustice, it's all placed upon him, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And the point is the same. We're meant to see the costliness of that forgiveness. Our sin is not a trifling thing. The Son of God was crucified for it. And so when you ask God for forgiveness, you know that price has already been paid. You know, there was a, a fellow named John Wesley, kind of a theologian, pastor, songwriter, uh, who called this idea God's prevenient grace, which was God's grace and forgiveness that had been given even before you asked. You just have to unwrap it. Reminds me that my sister, two Christmases ago, gave our family uh, a gift certificate to Blue Mountain. Her name's Elaine. She gave us this gift certificate, and uh, it was so that we could go spend a weekend at Blue Mountain. And uh, you know what? We never got around to using it. And a whole year went by, and now it's been over a year, and we still, we still intend to use it, but we haven't used it yet. 
And so in some ways, she paid for it long ago. She bought the gift certificate. She packaged it all up. She sent it off to us. We already have it. It's all paid for, but we just haven't cashed it in yet. And we just haven't enjoyed it yet. That's how God's mercy is. God has already done everything. He's already paid everything necessary to save us and forgiveness. All we got to do is cash it in. All we got to do is open the gift and enjoy that mercy and that forgiveness. Paul kind of said it this way. He said, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Already done, just waiting to be opened up. If you're here today and you are struggling with some kind of guilt, something that happened in your past, say, I can't believe I did this or I can't shake this feeling, And you you can't imagine that God would ever forgive you. Do you know that when Jesus was on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive, insert name here, insert your name here, right? Do you know the Father has already prayed that prayer? Or Jesus already prayed that prayer, and the Father has already answered that prayer already. You've been forgiven. And a little later in our service, we are going to get a time of confession, and you're going to get the chance to experience the joy of forgiveness, not the guilt. So, first, we are the them. Second, we have a problem. Third, we have been forgiven. But fourthly, we now have this wonderful model. Jesus didn't come just to die for us, but to show us how to live. While we maybe have straying down this path, doing things that hurt ourselves and hurt others, Jesus comes along and says, I want to show you another path. I want to show you another way to be human, another way to experience the fullness of life. Come follow me. Let me show you how to live. And one of the things that Jesus showed us more than anything else was how to forgive one another over and over again in Jesus' teaching. He's always showing. He's always modeling, especially even down to his dying breath. He's modeling how to forgive one another. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. His disciples heard him say things like, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And then he taught his disciples in the Lord's Prayer, which we're going to pray a little later on in the service. He said, Our Father, right, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You have to understand, Jesus is there. He's hanging on this cross. He's praying this prayer. But in so doing, he's also saying, forgive one another. Do you see what I'm doing? This is how I want you to live. This is what it means to follow my way. This is the answer to so much of the pain in the world, the hatred and the war that we find ourselves in, the the constant one-upmanship, always wanting to get back, the vengeance, the revenge with each other. Follow this way. Look at what I'm doing. I'm modeling something for you right now. You can't have a marriage that lasts longer than a year without learning to say, I'm sorry. You can't have a friendship that lasts over the long haul unless you're willing to forgive one another. Even if you have a business or or you you work in some industry, you're a leader, you're going to be the most miserable person in the world to work around if you're constantly carrying a grudge. In church, we'll never experience unity in a church like Trinity unless we're willing to forgive one another. I like to think that I'm kind of a forgiving person, and yet sometimes I feel it. I feel it welling up. I feel this resentment building up, and my stomach begins to churn. And and then I'm like in the shower, and I'm having this imaginary conversation with that person, and I'm telling them how bad they are, and I'm really giving them the gears. And and when I'm doing that, i got to tell you, the only person who's really getting hurt... The only person who hears what I'm saying is me. And it's like the old quote goes that, you know, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. The only way there's going to be joy for me is to learn to pray, Father, forgive them. And in the end, the only way to find the reconciliation is when we're willing to forgive even before the other person has thought to ask for it. Now, that doesn't mean we don't need to be smart. 
and there aren't some consequences. It's okay to say, I forgive you, but it doesn't necessarily mean we have to be around that person all the time if it's not healthy. Boundaries are important, but forgiveness still needs to flow. So let me just say this. If you're ever tempted to say, oh, yeah, 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 but Jesus wouldn't understand my problem. Jesus wouldn't know what this person did to me. If Jesus had been through what I've been through, then he would never be saying, Father, for, forgive them. But really, come on. This is a guy hanging on a cross, tortured, and he prays this prayer. And he's inviting us to pray this prayer with him. We are the them. We are the people who need forgiving. We have a problem. It's called sin. But we have already been forgiven. God's grace is given to us. All we got to do is open it up and enjoy it. And we have a model. Jesus shows us how to be people of mercy as we follow his way of forgiveness. Father, forgive them. Yeah, that's, those are the words Jesus spoke. But those are the words Jesus wants us to live as well. So thanks be to God. Amen.